In today's video, I'm going to be painting up a unit so powerful it can inflict mortal wounds in real life. So, I'm not much for competitive Warhammer. I don't make much of a secret of the fact that I think that by balancing around competitive play, the game is actively made worse. Like, look at the nonsense that plagued the game towards the end of 9th edition. Like, fair play Goonhammer for keeping people informed, but like, what is even going on here? However, if you clicked on this video, you might feel differently, and angling for competitive play seems to be working out for Games Workshop. As I have thousands of points of Tyranids to paint before their Codex releases, I thought, what better place to start than one of the most competitive units in the whole army? But first, this strange place is not the hobby room. This is where I'm going to be doing my live streaming for the channel, because if we are going to get through all of the Tyranid models that I've still got left to be painted, including not one, but two Screamer Killers, we are going to need to get some serious dedicated hobby timing. That's why I'm going to be live streaming on Tuesdays. Make sure that you are subscribed to Hobby with Ollie here on YouTube so you can be notified when I go live. But where does a casual for fun gamer like me go when they have absolutely no idea about competitive Warhammer? Where better to start than the absolute workhorse of all things 40k, Orspex Tactics, who I'm not entirely convinced isn't a servitor. In several videos on his channel, he's mentioned a powerful unit, including in his Tyranids tier list video, where they are described as bringing some of the best damage and defense that the Tyranids have. You might have already guessed, but today I'm going to be painting up the Tyranids' own mind-melting, psychic-shielding, squidly boys, Zoanthropes. Now before I get into that, what's your pick for the most competitive Tyranids unit of 10th edition? I'd be really interested here in the comments down below. So what is it that makes Zoanthropes so good? Well, for a start, they have access to high strength weaponry, including an immense strength 12 from Focused Witchfire, which deals D6 plus 1 damage. That is going to sting. They've also got a 4 plus invuln save, give nearby models a 6 plus invulnerable save, which is seriously useful for expendable bug swarms like termagants or rippers. Lastly, they're pretty cheap, with a squad of 3 coming in at a cost cutting 90 points. Okay, I'm sold. The only problem is that I've only got two metal zoanthropes, which is less than you need for a unit. I looked into buying a zoanthrope off eBay, but in the end, I decided to go for the cheaper option. Well, sort of cheaper. I actually have not one, but two Leviathan boxes, having bought the second Tyranid half of a client who commissioned me the Space Marine half. That means I've got loads of Termagants, but some duplicates of the characters and bigger models that I find myself unlikely to use in most of my games. It was then that I had a brainwave. Pun not intended. <laughs> it's not going to take too much effort to convert the Neuro Tyrant into a Zoanthrope, or more specifically into the squad leader, a Neurothrope. Sorry buddy, but you're getting a demotion. By removing his symbiotic flesh cape, which is a great band name by the way, he's ready for a little head swap. I snip away parts of the head until I can get the Neurothrope crest to fit, slowly taking away pieces bit by bit. I then secured this in place with plastic glue before tackling the gaping hole left behind by my endeavours. Editing Ollie from the future here, if you are planning on converting your own Neurothrope out of a Neuro Tyrant, you also need to make sure you remove the part on the back where the flesh cape attaches to. It is amazing how similar the two kits are once you remove this part. I squidged some Milliput into the gap, carving some lines into it with a toothpick while it cures. Now the base on this guy was surprisingly tricky. Having lost his flesh cape, he only has one anchor point, but by soaking it in plastic glue and propping it up in the right position, I get this newly demoted Neurothrope onto his base. Once he's primed up, he really looks like part of the squad, but I will say plastic Neurothrope versus the metal Zoanthropes is such a massive difference in weight. They're not the prettiest, but they are now a full unit of Zoanthropes. If you're enjoying the video so far, drop me a like and also subscribe to the channel so that you can be notified when my next video comes out next Sunday. For a prime with off-white, I painted thinned down Reichland flesh shade over all the tentacly parts, highlighting back up with off-white where needed. But here's where using metal models really bit me. Literally. One of the metal zoanthropes had fallen off his base and no amount of superglue was going to save him. I decided to pin the model, which is fairly usual in these kind of circumstances, and I have done it before on certain models. 
Now to start with, I needed to drill into the metal stand part on the base. This went about as well as you'd expect, and one broken drill bit and a plaster applied to my thumb later, I decided I needed to change tack. My first option was a blob of Miller parts, but that didn't really cut it, so I opted instead for a scenic basing solution. I wanted to show this zoanthrope in the middle of the swarm, while also having something to secure him to his base. A suitable part was located in the infestation node that comes with gene stealers. I superglued this in place and added some gene stealer arms as supports wrapping around the bottom tentacle of the zoanthrope. The gene stealer arms were secured with plastic glue, which means that they're going to set really rigid and really firm, hopefully keeping this guy in place. With that whole ordeal out of the way, we can finally get back to painting. I continued with the base coats, starting with the carapace, which I layered over with a dark purple. Next on base coats, I applied black to the claws, and then carabag crimson onto the claw arm, so I've got a bit of variation in those fleshy parts. Now, if these guys are going to be shielding and blasting psychic energy across the battlefield, they're gonna need some serious glowy blue brains. I painted the brain parts with white before bringing out my trio of favorite blues. Blues trio. <laughs> Dark blue, medium blue, and sky blue. I first painted the dark blue onto the raised areas of the brains before painting into the gaps with medium blue and then with additional sky blue mixed in. I lastly thinned down sky blue and ran it into the recesses. And as well as not being too neat with this, so I can show a bit of a glow effect, I'm really, really pleased with how it's come out. Next is my favorite part of painting the Tyranids. The striations in purple, which I started off by painting onto the bottom third of each armor panel in random patterns. I next made a lighter purple using purple and white, and then took my finest detail brush, a triple zero from Artis Opus. I use this to apply lines towards the edges of each armor panel. This helps to show the sort of growth marks um, as these are very rapidly developed organisms to match any kind of threat they may face. So I wanted to show that with the painting. With a bit of carmine red on the claws, a few touch-ups and basing, and these zoanthropes are ready to bring a competitive edge to Hive Queen Meg's inevitable swarm. There we go, so I've got three more zoanthropes. There's still a lot more to go, so make sure that you're subscribed so that you know when I'm going live on YouTube here. It's gonna be a busy few weeks. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. My name has been Ollie, this has been my hobby, and I'll see you next time.